Hi everyone, thank you for joining today and welcome to part one of the Advancing SDOH Interoperability Enabling Privacy and Consent Through Standards and Implementations webinar series. Today we'll be talking about the status of standards relevant to supporting SDOH data exchange. So just a few housekeeping items I wanted to go over at the outset here. Attendees are muted by default, so please make sure to keep your phone on mute. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available at the Advancing SDOH Health IT Enabled Tools and Data Interoperability Confluence site, which is linked to here. This slide deck is also accessible under the handout section of the GoToWebinar widget, which might be at the top of your screen or over at the side of your screen. It will also be made available at the Confluence site too. You should also be able to see a questions box. And as we go along, if you guys have any questions or comments for any of the panelists, please let us know. We'll be moderating it throughout the presentation and we'll address any questions at the end during the Q&A portion. So I had a quick agenda slide here that I wanted to go over. Um, that's okay, I have a print out here too. Um, I will be passing over the mic very briefly to Elizabeth Myers and Ryan Argentieri from the Office of the National Coordinator for opening remarks. And then I will give a very brief overview of the webinar series and then the ONC project that is hosting the series. And then I will turn it over to Jonathan Coleman who will give an introduction of security tags and the ONC final rule and talk a bit about data tagging and standards. And then we'll move on to the standards portions of the presentations. And we will have Josh Mandel talk about Smart V2. Kathleen Connor will talk about the data segmentation for privacy fire implementation guide and the USCDI security labels. I'm hoping we can have a quick five minute break here, but we'll see how we are with timing. Um, if we do get back from the break, we'll have Nancy Lush talk about the heart standard and then Bob Dieterle give an overview of the HL7 SDOH clinical care implementation guide. And then hopefully we'll have some time at the end to go over some Q&A. So with that, I will turn it over to Elizabeth Myers at ONC for opening remarks. Hi, thank you. Um, as uh, many of you on the phone may know, ONC has been focused for several years now on working collaboratively with stakeholders um, to support expanded adoption and use of data tagging or data segmentation standards. Um, and in our most recent rulemaking, which was published last May, so just about a year ago, um, we did finalize adoption of the HL7 standard for data tagging at the more granular level, so including both document, um, segment, and um, data element level. So we're delighted that uh, so many of you are here with us today from a wide range of care settings and developers and standards organizations and state organizations um, to sort of join this conversation and take some next steps towards progressing these ideas of, of how data segmentation and tagging can support um, new and innovative means of care. Um, for those of you who have been leading in this space uh, for years with your technical expertise, I thank you for your dedication and taking time to present to your colleagues today, because uh, that is what you'll be hearing from. And for those of you who are less familiar with this space, um, we want to welcome you and say that we're very glad you're here and beginning to engage now. Um, while a lot of the content you'll hear today is admittedly fairly technical, Please don't be intimidated. Please uh, speak up, participate, ask your questions, um, because you don't have to be a health IT developer or standards um, development organization member to be able to identify uh, opportunities where technical and policy supports could be expanded to help advance uh, a more holistic person-centered care. And data segmentation and the concepts around it are a key tool in advancing that. So our goal is to support care that respects a patient's choice and that enables sensitive health data to flow in a secure manner and allow for a holistic or longitudinal view of an individual's care needs, their goals, their treatment plan, and pieces of that that are essential to ensuring that the data can move and that it can be secure and private and still reflect the patient's choice and goals are data tagging and consent management. These two pieces of data tagging and consent management are important considerations both within the minutia of the day to day, but in also in efforts to improve interoperability because we need to be moving data forward and thinking about the free flow of data while protecting privacy and patient choice. 
So data tagging can support a wide range of use cases where privacy needs are very complex or where privacy needs may be varied, such as pediatric care, behavioral health, opioid use disorder, all of these things that you're all familiar with that are very clunky manual processes at this point in time and are starting to evolve as more technological capabilities become available. But it also holds the potential as being a catalyst to change how we use data in more innovative ways to inform care. And that includes sort of um, some of these wide ranging things that we're, we're beginning to hear about, um, but specifically what we want to talk about today with social determinants of health and how to leverage tools that take care of the whole person in ways that we may not have been able to do before if we have more readily available data. So this webinar is part of ONC's effort to disseminate information on why and how we can begin to move sensitive health data, keeping in mind patient choice, keeping in mind privacy restrictions and laws, but allow it to support a more holistic and person-centered approach to healthcare. This is a two-part webinar series, so thank you for joining us today, and we hope you will come back on June 2nd as well, where you'll heal progress on different SDOH use cases and the value of data tagging, tagging and consent efforts and how these things intersect and support the advancing of health equity and addressing health disparities, as well as thinking about a broader scope of improving outcomes across the healthcare system. Um, I am joined today by my colleague, Ryan Argentieri, who is going to pass on giving a opening comments so that we can get into the meat of the discussion and make sure we have plenty of time for all of our panelists to talk. Um, Ryan is the deputy director in our Office of Technology, so my, my direct counterpart on the technology side, who I've been working with for several years um, as we advance our policy and technical goals in this space together. So again, thank you all for attending, and we welcome you to the discussion. Thanks, Matt. This is Ryan. I just wanted to thank everyone for being here. Uh, and Amber, I'll turn it back to you in a minute, but just um, say to echo the comments about the technical nature of what we'll be discussing today. Um, we at ONC really are supportive of the standard and our certification program and are working across uh, the stakeholder base to get feedback and input about how we can better drive adoption um, and work more closely together. Um, so thanks for being here and please we please please speak up just to just say that again to make sure everyone hears hears that ask and thanks to all of you who are here as audience members participants and subject matter experts so with that turn it back over to the host great thank you both so my name is Amber Patel and I am the project manager for ONC's Advancing SDOH Health IT Enabled Tools and Data Interoperability Project. Essentially, this is a year long project that started in September of 2020. And what we are looking at is two specific health IT tools, so data tagging and clinical decision support, and how we can utilize these two tools to help advance SDOH interoperability. The first portion of our um, project here has been focused on data tagging, which is why data tagging is a subject of this webinar series. Brian, next slide. And next one. One more, thanks. Um, all right, so a bit more about the webinar series. We are here today, you can go back one, um, for part one where we're gonna be talking about the standards relevant to supporting SDOH data exchange through enabling privacy protections, the capture of patient consent and data tagging. Um, as Beth had mentioned, part two will take place on Wednesday, June 2nd from two to three, and it will feature presentations from organizations working to leverage, test, and implement the standards that we're discussing today. So if you haven't done so already, please go ahead and register for that. We've included a link here. Um, one thing I did wanna mention that we try to be cognizant of when we were putting the series together is that SDOH data spans various settings. So you have healthcare organizations, community-based organizations, social service organizations that all use and need this data. So while we are highlighting the work that's being done in the space, we're also really hoping that we can highlight some of the people and organizations that are part of the space so you guys can connect with each other. Next slide. Um, it looks like we're having a bit of slide difficulties here. So I'll just move forward. Um, 
Thanks, Brian. So I just kind of wanted to close with why we're here today talking about standards. So we know that up to 80% of a person's health is determined by social factors and access to this type of data is critical. I included a quote here from Jacob Ryder. Um, it came from a recent article titled, Why Interoperability is Key to Social Determinants of Health Efforts. And in it, he says, when I was a family doctor and a patient would tell me about a need that our organization didn't address, such as housing instability, food insecurity or transportation challenges, often I would look something up quickly on the internet and then scribble the number of some kind of service down on a yellow sticky note. So this is good, but we can do better. And we have tools that can help us do better. So that's why we're here today to learn about some of these tools, where we're at with utilizing them and the potential for utilizing them in the future for SDOH interoperability. So we're very excited you guys have joined us today and we hope you find this informative. And with that, I'll pass it over to Jonathan. Thank you. All right, thanks, Amber, and good afternoon, everybody. This is Jonathan Coleman with Security Risk Solutions, and some of you may know me from um, working collaboratively over at HL7. I'm one of the co-chairs of Community-Based Care and Privacy Workgroup, um, so I work with many of you in that realm um, and in support of various ONC projects, so thanks again for joining. Um, and just before I get started, I, I do want to acknowledge here that um, we don't expect everybody that's participating in this webinar today to be able to digest the, the ins and outs of every technical aspect of the standards world. The standards world can be, um, uh, I guess, um, difficult for people to understand who haven't really been introduced to it before. There might be some jargon, um, but our, our expert panel um, that's going to be presenting throughout the series, both, both today and next week, are, are really uh, good at demystifying some of this. So again, if you do have questions um, or if it sounds overly complex, um, please do, you know, reach out and ask questions in the chat or in the Q&A in the Q&A passage. Um, but I do think it's important to know a little bit about what goes on behind the scenes. And some of these standards are used not just to help ensure interoperability, but to make life easier for the end users. And so, in this case, um, looking at security tags, um, knowing that the EHR systems, um, the, the user applications. Um, are doing things in the background to make our life easier and help share the patient information appropriately um, is, is important. So with that, I'm going to start by talking just very briefly, next slide please, um, about what has changed since the 2015 edition um, to the, the current ONC final rule, um, part of the information blocking, interoperability and certification program areas under the 21st Century Cures Act. Um, it was modified in the final rule, um, and there have been, um, I guess, changes to some of the, the language, um, but also in some of the granularity. And I'm going to I'm going to walk through that now in the next two or three slides, and then get into a high-level use case um, to talk through notionally how data tagging can be used to help this information flow uh, appropriately. So next slide, please. So in the 2015 edition, um, the names changed. Um, that's one of the changes here. So in 17315B7, it was called Data Segmentation for Privacy Send, which was used for creating a summary record using the DSOP standard. And that has now changed to Security Tags Summary of Care Send. Um, and similarly, the Data Segmentation for Privacy Receive criterion, um, which is being used to um, receiver summary record um, that conforms to the DSP standard is changed to security tags summary of care receive. Next slide. And in this slide, um, and, and, and then the next two, we're going to talk just a little bit about that in more detail. So previously, um, the, the 2015 edition only required security tagging of the CCDA documents at the document level. And if you think about sort of the Russian doll concept here, um, if this DA document is going to have, uh, you know, the document with its overall banner and label and, and header and so on. Um, and then within that, you have sections and within that you have entries. And so based on public comment, industry field testing, advances in, in the adoption, various listening sessions and so on, ONC has updated the requirements for these criteria. While they're still voluntary, um, they do now um, have to support or will support security tagging at the document section and entry levels of that CCDA. 
Um, and that's to better reflect the overall purpose of the labels, the criteria, um, and to help the doctors support this more granular approach to security tagging of clinical documents to meet the needs of the, of the end users and the, and the beneficiaries. So next slide. So here's the text, and um, the only reason I'm really showing this, um, this is Summary of Care Send, is to, to show you that the text refers to two other standards, and they'll, they'll be discussed as well uh, a little bit later. Um, but for Send, it enables a user to create a summary of record that's formatted in accordance with the standard adopted in 170.205A4, and that is the C CDA for clinical notes and is tagged as restricted and subject to any restrictions on redisclosure, according to, and then that is the data segmentation for privacy standard. And that's at the, doction, at the document um, section and entry level, or up until December 31st, 2022, um, still at the document level. And so on the next slide, we have the, the similar text um, for receive. And again, it stipulates um, the, the CCDA, and the data segmentation for privacy standard um, at the document section and entry level. But it also says in, in part two there to preserve privacy markings to ensure fidelity to the tagging based on consent and with respect to sharing and redisclosure restrictions. And Kathleen's going to talk about that in much more detail um, uh, as, it, as it pertains to FHIR. Um, but next slide, please. I'm going to talk us through a high level notional use case here in just two slides to set the stage for our, for our following presenters. So in this case, the big blue rectangle is um, a healthcare organization. Um, the patient who's there depicted in green um, receives care for a variety of conditions, including substance misuse as part of an alcohol drug abuse treatment program. Um, so during this interaction, um, the, the, uh, the patient and the provider are talking and any data that requires additional protection and consent if applicable are captured and recorded. And in this example, you can see the little chart down there at the bottom. It says alcohol, allergy, and drugs. And these are just examples. Um, and then there are two columns. Column two is for organization two, and column three represents organization three. So in this case, the patient has said that they're okay with their information flowing freely to organization two, but they would prefer the alcohol and drug information not go to organization number three, but the allergy information could. Again, just a notional use case. Next slide, please. So the patient now needs the data to be sent to this third party organization. Um, and in this diagram, the green box on the right is the second healthcare organization that information was allowed to be shared with. So because this disclosure has been authorized by the patient, the data that required heightened protection, such as the alcohol or drug misuse information, um, can flow to organization number four. So again, in this diagram, the information does flow from organization one to organization number two, but we've put a little yellow warning sign on that chart there on the bottom to show that the alcohol and drug information is subject to some kind of further restriction, such as a prohibition on redisclosure without consent. So how does all that happen behind the scenes and what makes that work? That's what we're going to be talking about in our, uh, with our next speakers. Um, next slide, please. This, this does rely on some of the underlying standards, and there are a number of them that work hand in hand. Um, the data segmentation for privacy standard is not um, the sole answer to, to any of this, and it does utilize vocabularies, it references other standards. Um, and I've highlighted two here that, that you may have uh, people talking about throughout the day today, um, the confidentiality code, which um, is used to represent um, an overall level of restriction on a CDA document, for example. Um, in the CCDA, that has been uh, constrained to the values of normal, restricted, or very restricted. So think of that as the, the high watermark or the high level restriction that goes on the outside of an envelope. Um, and then the refrain policy that is contained with that specifies any further special handling instructions, such as a prohibition on redisclosure without consent. And there are others as well, such as purpose of use, obligation codes, 
um, and, and sensitivity policies. So with that, I'm going to um, conclude my portion of the presentation here. Next slide, please. Um, and turn it over to Josh next, who's going to talk about SMART, um, and then hand it over to Kathleen Connor for data segmentation for privacy with FHIR and USCDI. And then, as Amber said, um, Nancy will talk about HEART, and then Bob Deatley, the HL7 SDOH Clean and Cold Care Implementation Guide. So, Josh, over to you, sir, and thank you. Perfect. And if I can get the ability to do some screen sharing, I'll get that set up as we go. Uh, what I want to do is give a very brief introduction to some of the goals behind the Smart on Fire uh, APIs. And these are really a way to allow individual users uh, who have access to data within a, a healthcare data system to share or delegate some subset of their access to an application of their choice. Um, so let me let me say that just just to define a couple of terms here, uh, rather than an approach like uh, like in the data segmentation for privacy, where you might have two organizations talking directly to one another on behalf of an individual. Here, what we have is uh, what's called an OAuth interaction, and I'll show you an example of this in just a moment, where we start with a user who has access to some data in what we call a smart enabled EHR. And that could be like a patient portal, so an individual patient accessing their own records, but it could also be a healthcare financial data portal or any other kind of system that's managing clinical or healthcare financial data. We use the term EHR as, as kind of a shorthand. So the user who has access to these data can decide to delegate some access, some subset of their own access to an application of their choice. And then that smart application now has delegated access and it can write queries back to the EHR to fetch data uh, from that EHR. And there's a couple of very important constraints in place by the time this app is making requests for data. Uh, first of all, since this app's uh, permissions are entirely based on the user who delegated it to them, an app will never be able to access data that the delegating user couldn't see. So that's really fundamental to the model that we have in Smart on Fire is you can only share access that you have. Um, and then the second important highlight is users might downscope or share a specific subset of their own access when they're sharing data with an app. So just to give you a quick sense of what this looks like, uh, I'll do a quick example from um, the open source smart app launcher that we have, and I'll include links to all these in the notes afterwards. Uh, but the smart app launcher is really a developer tool that allows software developers to test out the different features of these smart APIs. And I've set up uh, a testing app here, where basically you can think of this as maybe an app that you're going to launch from the home screen of your iPhone or your Android phone, uh, where you want to launch this app and connect it to an EHR. And we're exposing a bunch of technical details here because it's a testing tool, but these details represent the scopes or the permissions that an app is going to ask for. And so when a user says, yes, I want to connect the app to my EHR, that's the equivalent of clicking this run button in our example, uh, they're asked to sign into their patient portal. And so in this example, it's the smart patient portal, which um, doesn't have any real user accounts. You could just type anything you want here, but it's got some synthetic patient data just to show you what the overall flow looks like. So an individual patient logs in and they'll get a, an approval screen uh, asking them if they want to share certain access. <laughs> I realize I actually um, may have skipped that approval screen uh, here as a setting in our demo. So let me do one more quick demo just to, just to give you a quick sense after a patient logs in they'll be presented with an approval screen that explains what this app is asking for. So in this example, it says the app is requesting permission to read your profile and your medical information and some of the current um, context. And you can see here, this is a very broad scope, quote unquote, your medical information. So what I want to talk about next is rather than just giving approval or rejecting apps at the level of an entire clinical record, how can we get into more fine grained access? So that's really where the Smart on Fire scope system comes into play. And in the Smart uh, 1.0 release, which is what's named in ONC's final rules from last year, we have Fire-based scopes, which is to say scopes that are based on the FAST healthcare interoperability resource standards. So every resource that exists in Fire becomes a kind of a scope or a permission that you can ask about. So in this example here, I might be asking for observations, meaning I want to read all observations associated with the current patient record. And of course, this is much narrower than saying, I want to see all the data in the patient record. By asking for just observations, I'm not asking to see documents or allergies or conditions. Um, 
but it may also still be quite broad because observations in the fire specification include everything from lab results to vital signs to social history. And of course, lab results could be highly sensitive or uh, run of the mill. Uh, but this was about all the permissions that we had in SMART 1.0. They were tied to fire resource types. And if, if an app wanted something just like a subset of observations, the way to ask for it was to ask for this fire resource type. And then the app could always issue narrower queries, but it might technically be authorized to see more data than it's asking for with each of those narrow queries. So that's where we landed in SMART v1. And the good thing about this is that it got us started. Uh, it was relatively easy to implement from a technical perspective, and it opened up some important use cases like being able to share large subsets of your clinical records with an app of your choice. Uh, we recognize that there are real limitations to this scope language in Smart V1. And so we've introduced a, a set of improvements that are coming down the line in Smart version two. These are improvements that have not yet landed in a published specification, but their active work, their work in progress right now in HL7, basically to take this simple scope, like read all observations, and append uh, a few extra details to it, namely what FHIR calls search parameters. So in this example, rather than saying, I want to read all observations, I'm saying, actually, I want to scope that down based on an observations category. And so in this case, I'm saying, I only want to access observations that are in the vital signs category. That's an example of attaching a search parameter to one of these scopes, and that allows us to go from a request for all observations to just a request for observations in that category. The ongoing work that I mentioned in order to define this syntax uh, is available in the FHIR continuous integration build, and I won't get too much into the technical details, but I just wanted to, to show very briefly uh, an example of what these different syntaxes look like. And they're based on either data associated with a single patient's record or the set of patients that our users able to see. Uh, or in the case of two backend systems talking directly to each other, we have something called system level access. But I think that's less relevant for these use cases. Uh, we, we Just like in smart version one, we tie these access requests to specific fire resource types, but then we add on a set of these fire search parameters, which are ways to restrict access. Now, FHIR has a rich set of different search parameters documented in the specification. So for example, if we look at the search parameters that are defined for the FHIR observation resource, every resource in FHIR lists a set of search parameters at the bottom of the, the specification page. Uh, and you can see this last section here is all about the different search parameters, the different ways by which you can scope or filter or restrict a query for observations. So we've been looking at an example of scoping them by category, but you can also scope them based on dates or specific codes about what has been observed, who observed it, many different properties uh, of the observation that you can use to filter down uh, and potentially, you could use any one of these search parameters as a way to narrow down your scopes in SMART version 2. Um, so that is a very important opportunity to express finer grained permissions. But it also represents a real implementation challenge for servers that might have all kinds of different fine grained requests that are not easy to implement technically or not easy to support at scale. Uh, so I wanted to highlight this because in the core spec, we don't say that every single search parameter needs to work for these kinds of granular access use cases. We define a syntax that can work for all of them, but we expect that specific servers may be following um, narrower or restricted guidance that will pull out a few examples that are really important, like potentially category. Another example of a kind of search parameter that's come up in our standards community discussions has been the idea of a tag or a security label. Uh, and so these are the ways in FHIR that, that we've been talking about in the context uh, of data segmentation for privacy, where security labels can tell you something about the sensitivity or type of content inside of a resource. And so just like you can filter on uh, a category, you can filter on search parameters like security as well using this new smart V2 syntax. It's still very early days. We're just getting some of our first very basic implementer experience working with some of the simplest granular scopes like category, but there's a lot of interest in taking this work forward and seeing uh, which additional scopes we can call out in implementation guides like uh, the US core fire implementation guides, which align with ONC's requirements. So I'll pause there. Happy to answer questions uh, in chat or go into more detail. I know this was a fairly technical overview, but I hope at least this gives you a sense of where we've been and where we're going.
Thank you, Josh. We will turn it over to Kathleen now. Making sure I'm unmuted. Hi, everyone. I'm Kathleen Connor. I am an HL7 security co-chair, and I also am a financial management co-chair, which is an interesting combination. But today I'm focusing on data segmentation for privacy, which is in the scope of the security work group. Okay, so I'm moving the slides. I'm not sure how this is going to go. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, you know what I'm going to do? Can uh, Brian just move this, the slides? Because my slide deck is misbehaving anyway. So, you want to do that? Next slide. Great. <laughs> oh, man, now I forgot. Now I know the reason why. Okay, I added something. Okay, so the agenda is to give a short presentation on, that's going to focus on the FIRE data segmentation for privacy. People see DS4P as the acronym or, you know, that that's data segmentation for privacy. So just keep that in mind. And um, it's assuming some familiarity with security labeling, data segmentation, poli policies, technologies, standards, and you've already gotten a taste of that from the previous presenters. Thank you, um, Josh and uh, Jonathan, for doing that. Uh, but one, one way I think about it, I mean, for, from a layperson's perspective, it's like the um, non-GMO, no cruelty, poison, child danger, uh, crosswalk, those kinds of icons that are very familiar to us, that metadata is very much what security labels are on content that needs additional protections in order to share it. Next slide. So hopefully that gives some context for people. All right. So this is a snapshot of the current data segmentation for privacy ballot. We validated it previously in 2020 in May, and we are you know, correcting mistakes, fixing vocabularies, and adding uh, more features, and we can plan to continue to do this. So this is a very much an evolving work. Um, the second one is providing a, a additional guidance not only on how fire resources at the there's if you look at a resource it's got this section called meta which is in front of everything that is the content that you want to convey and meta can be used to convey the policies and other things that apply to that content so in fire there is there are security labels already but they are not specifically conformant to the underlying you want to go back? <laughs> Please go back to where you're getting ahead of me. Thank you. To the healthcare classification system, also known as HCS, which is foundational in HL7. It's a conceptual uh, model that explains how to apply security labels. And they are used in access control systems. So these are actually computable uh, metadata to um, govern how information is collected, accessed, used, or disclosed and in particular for fire. And so it ensures that a particular policy uh, will apply to enable sharing with protections. And segmentation itself is the, is the process of sequestering from cap capture access view of certain data elements or data types that are perceived by a legal entity, institution, organization, or individual as being undesirable to share. So that's an important seminal definition that came out of a paper from George Washington University, Melissa Goldstein, I hope I got that right, uh, is the main author of that work, but it's been uh, very important from the privacy perspective about what drives uh, data segmentation. Next slide, please. <laughs> okay, so the basis of security labeling in HCS, uh, HCS again is the conceptual model, and it's been applied to other product families in HL7. So for example, the original HL7 version two, which is used for admit, discharge, transfer, and labs, and a ton of different use cases for messaging. We have now um, incorporated security labeling and we emulate the HCS conceptual syntax, but specifically for use in HL7 version two, and it's in version 2.9, but it can be pre-adopted by anyone who's doing a much earlier version of 
HL7 V2, such as V2.51, which is pretty popular. And it's also in the CDA. So we have a data segmentation for privacy uh, CDA IG, which has been very uh, important in terms of meaningful use, and I think uh, is underlying the uh, current regulations for granular uh, segmentation. And there's also a data provenance IG, which builds on that and adds provenance. Okay, so the HCS basically is this, the healthcare version of what the intelligence community has used for years to classify their information with with uh, you know metadata like top secret secret no foreigners limited dis uh, dissemination codes so that they basically are informing through the metadata that its content is restricted to access to the end users based on their need to know so this is very foundational uh, it's in security standards it, there are NIST specifications and a plethora of DOD directives on this that we use to build the healthcare classification system so the the syntax is dictating how the security label terminology is used to populate these fields and they're called name tag sets and there's a special uh, structure that the next slide will show you kind of a bird's eye view of i go to the next slide please there you are okay so this is based on a, a standard it's called nist 800 uh, 188, which is now retired, but is based on still uh, ex uh, still active ISO standards. And it's, you know, it's, I think Mike Davis used to call it a choo-choo train in which each car had some something in it. So basically name tag set is a bucket. And in the bucket, there are name tag set names and a name tag set name is a container of values. So as Jonathan talked about earlier, one of the main ones, and one and only one you have to have to have a security label is security classification. That's the confidentiality code. You can do a lot with the confidentiality code, and it is driven by the other codes that are influenced, that are being conveying a policy. So if you had part two, you know, 42, 42 CFR part two substance use information, and you didn't have a means for saying the rest of it, like this is 42 CFR, the substance use uh, sensitivity. If you just put the restricted confidentiality code, you would do a lot in terms of protecting it. So that's critical. The security categories is where you put things like what compartment, like it's a care team, the policy, it's 42 CFR, it's CUI, it's HIPAA, and other things like the sensitivity. Uh, the next one is the security controls. Those are the obligations. Uh, refrains and purposes of use, basically they're telling senders and users what they can and cannot do with the information. There's also a security label field, which is basically a category of sorts, but we have it separate, and which is an evolving area where you can th do things like say that this information has been proved to a certain level, uh, that this uh, patient was identified with this kind of proofing mechanism, et cetera. And the last part is, uh, metadata about metadata. So you can actually have trust contracts that encapsulate what the community has decided is the security label that they're going to use to describe a certain policy. Next slide, please. And please remind me of time because I could go over here. Okay, so why why even bother with Fire DS4P when you have security labels in Fire already, which is great? It's because the security labels in Fire are basically a kitchen sink. So there's no structure, it doesn't emulate this uh, HCS, although it does you know, tip its hat to HCS. It, if you had two security labels, which is not in common, you could have information that was governed under HIPAA and part two, and it might have a controlled and classified information label on it as well. You would not be able to parse the kitchen sink of labels that you would get in Fire without the use of the extensions, which are the primary value of the Fire DS for PIG. And so we'll talk about that next. You can see that that's what it looks like in Fire Basic. Okay, so the extensions that we have, the uh, most important one is the policy basis. It basically puts a, a, a delineator around the codes. There, each code is associated with the specific policy that 
to which it applies. So you, again, the teacher you train, you got this private confidentiality, sensitivity, purpose of use, whatever. Each one of those that belongs to a specific policy has the extension tag with it. So you know that HIPAA information might be regulated or, or protected at the level of the norm or normal confidentiality, but the part two is uh, protected with restricted. So you can tell which codes go to which, even though what you're getting, if you look at the code, is just a kitchen sink. The next one is a classifier. This is um, something we don't have in the other uh, V2 and CDA uh, IGs. Well, the DPROV uh, CDA does have it. It's a way to tell who put that who put that label on and who might have changed that label. So you can track it because as information crosses policy domains, it it changes the labels, and you may want to know that this information that the patient uh, disclosed from a covered entity was governed under HIPAA, once it goes out to an app, it's no longer governed under HIPAA, it's been declassified or reclassified, let's say that, to a different level where the laws that apply might be, for example, the FTC. So that's the importance of knowing the classifier, and that's something that comes from the intelligence community as well. Uh, related artifacts, if you want to know, hey, there's this policy label, but where's the policy? Which consent directive is it? Where's the provenance? Um, you can actually reference with a, a, a pointer the exact basis for that policy. And the other one that's important is the, the other part that's important is related artifact, oh, excuse me, um, must display. Must display is where you tell the computer that they have to show something to end users. They're required to be able to see it. For example, uh, 42 part, 42 CFR part two requires or has required um, that end users know that they cannot redisclose it without consent. You might have something simple as the CUI that is required the controlled and classified information uh, label that federal agencies um, will likely soon have to apply. And you might just want to say that this is draft. Okay, in addition to, and this is the big change from 2020 May ballot, was we added sub resource labeling. And this had been a problem because there were things like if you look at an encounter resource, it could have tons of observations and all sorts of information as contained resources that didn't have their own meta. Um, or you might have a woman's uh, shelter as an address or a social security number that needed protection. So we devised an approach for letting, uh, you know, people, letting computers know, A, that there is an inline label so they don't have to check every resource, and then showing exactly where that label is. So those are the two um, new extensions. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm not going to pain you with going through this, but if you are an implementer and you really want to look, um, you can see, and I actually, in my deck, I actually highlighted or changed the font in the middle so that you could see where um, the extensions are, but they start with the word extension in the middle column, um, JSON snippet, and it goes all the way through to text. So you can see in the first one, there is the, um, which one is this one? This one is SEC basis. So, oh, 42 CFR, part two, you can see that in the middle. So that's telling you that this information, the restricted code is part of the label that is for part two. Next slide, please. Okay, here's the classifier. So after the word extension in JSON, you can see that John Doe is the classifier and information about where you can find Joe, John Doe. So it's, a, you know, gives some accountability for anybody who wants to change the label. You can find out when and where and find maybe even why it happened, which could be the provenance resource that was also included as um, a related artifact extension, which I believe is the next slide. Here it goes. Okay, so in this one under extension, you can see that there is a consent directive, a specific one with a number that is the basis for this particular label. And next slide, please. Okay, so here's must display. And in the middle under extension, you can see that this was the Veterans Administration had applied a CUI, which is the text that must be displayed with the 
ask us around it, which is CUI slash slash SP health, health and privacy. Well, that could be one way in which uh, the VA might want to um, mark their information. Next slide, please. Okay, so it sounds like it's time to go to USCDI. So we want to skip down a couple of slides. I think we're almost done with this anyway. Uh, just a quick note that we're doing cross-paradigm uh, IG, which will give examples on how to do it for uh, different, different uh, policies so people have an idea mostly on how to construct a security poly, policy based excuse, security label for a policy um, so that they can reach consensus on how to do that. Next slide is USCDI, and it's going to talk about how HL7, I'll go ahead, uh, the Policy Advisory Committee on Recommendations from uh, the work groups decided to recommend to uh, ONC to include security labels, some of the security labels in the USCDI, which is the US core data for interoperability, and they have classes and uh, data elements that have different levels of uh, maturity. Next slide, please. And uh, we recommended six as a minimum starter set to get the number of tags you basic, the types of tags you basically need to uh, convey the policies that are important in the US. And one of the uh, drivers for this has been uh, the Cures Granular Segmentation, the TEFCA Draft 2 speaks to security labels, and increasingly new US CDI classes and elements that need protection. And if there are not security labels for them, they could be a very vulnerable out there being used by the community without any drivers for putting uh, metadata to protect them, including identifiers, mother's maiden name, gender identity, et cetera. Okay, so you can see the list of the ones that are showing up in USCDI that we're going, especially social determinants of health. I mean, what part of social determinants of health couldn't be sensitive in some pay, uh, client situation? Next slide. So here's the TEFCA draft two. I don't know if it's going to be in the end TEFCA, but you could see that they are calling out uh, the use of security labels for those um, sensitive information is captured in the value set uh, that SAMHSA put forward called the consent to share sensitivity value set. And um, at, at a minimum to, to use the uh, confidentiality code that's required under a CDA, at least use the one that applies, like don't just default to normal. Okay, so next slide. Okay, so uh, the ones we recommended as for level, and they ended up being level one, which is great, was confidentiality and purpose of use, absolutely core to any security label. Next slide. So level one is just be, is down, there's there's the current US CDI, the draft US CDI, level two, level one, and comment. So comment is the lowest, and in that we have sensitivity policy, obligation, and refrain, those are the definitions, but we've discussed that before. Next slide. Um, so I'm just circling. This is a larger picture of that you know, diagram of what security labels look at, and I put circles around the ones that have been picked up by uh, USCDI. Next slide. Uh, this is just to give you an idea about how you use security labels uh, with priority tags to construct a, a policy uh, representation. So there's the steps, they're numbered in the slides that show you the kinds of uh, name tag sets and the kinds of values that are in those um, name tag sets. So if you wanted to know how, we will be explaining it more in the cross paradigm. Uh, US regulatory IG, which we hopefully will have out for ballot in September. Next slide, please. Close. Okay, um, is this needed? Why do we need it? Uh, we need it to enforce consent directives and individual rights of access, uh, to help certain in implementers understand how to fulfill the uh, optional document and granular segmentation certification criteria, and increasingly granular privacy protection of minors, mothers, abuse victims, and seniors' health 
uh, information, which are the US uh, use cases being worked on by the privacy protect, uh, protect privacy to promote interoperability use case. Okay, so um, I think this is the end of the presentation. Sounds like I'm worried about time. Um, and this is just, oh, this is an example I, I think is important that um, came up with a O and O um, orders and observation. They were coming, the labs are coming to them going, how are we going to indicate that the provider said, don't release this information because the patient needs to talk to me before they get it, now that the rules on information blocking have changed. So we figured out a set of security labels that could help labs or, in, and there's other use cases for somebody who wants to invoke the privacy blocking exception for privacy to be able to label the data, sort of make sure that uh, that exception is, is enforced, but also to cover their safe harbor needs in terms of saying, I didn't block this information for, you know, in a discriminatory way. So those are some of the use cases that will also end up in the cross-paradigm uh, IG. Okay, so uh, is there anything uh, else? No, I'm done. It's our break time. So hopefully I didn't take too much time from the breaks. Thank you. You did great, Kathleen. Thank you. Um, so we will pause here for a short break. Um, we will start up again. Let's let's take five minutes and then start up at, um, let's round up. <laughs> let's go. We'll come back at 3 p.m. All right, everyone, I make it top of the hour, so I think we can go ahead and start up again with Nancy talking about the heart standard. Hello, can you see my screen? Yes, it looks great, Nancy. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so I'm Nancy Lush from Patient Centric Solutions. Um, so heart is an interoperability standard. It allows the patient to control how their data is shared and it enables dynamic data exchange while protecting patient privacy. So I thought I'd start today's presentation with a little bit of a personal story, um, just to kind of put it in context. Around the time EMRs were completing meaningful use accredita accreditation, there were very few standards, and each state and region were using their own preferred protocols. Additionally, they were also each deciding which set of data they'd be exchanging. The number of interoperability integrations ahead looked more like a logarithmic curve. It was difficult to be hopeful. When the Fire API emerged, we were excited by the vision and became early adopters. Then coming from the patient engagement side, in combination with working with many providers, I was all too familiar with the various challenges and gaps in care. Sorry. Um, so HART addresses the following gaps and challenges in healthcare. A patient needs to see a specialist outside of our healthcare system, and too often there are long delays before that specialist gets access to the patient record. Sometimes a patient wishes to share their health data with a spouse or perhaps an adult child. A patient may choose to share her health data with a research organization. A new provider wants to provide care but does not have access with current diagnosis or treatment history and so many more use cases. The pain points are the human perspective. So there's a lot of frustration and waste of time. Patients repeatedly complete long paper forms from memory. There's a lack of patient access to their own consolidated medical record. And physicians waste time trying to find all the relevant medical information. Then we have the negative impacts in care. Patients often don't remember and they are unable to provide accurate medical data when asked. Physicians are forced to make decisions without complete accurate information, potentially leading to inappropriate treatment. And then we have all the repeat tests that are encountered, which are not only both costly, but not, not required. So why heart? HART was created to address these gaps and challenges. It enables the patient to safely share the health records with users of their choice in an interoperable way that respects and honors patient security and privacy. It enables patient-directed sharing of their clinical data. So what is HART? HART stands for Health Relationship Trust, and it's a set of profiles that enable patients to control how, when, and with whom the clinical data is shared. The HART, HART provides a standard to enable patient-directed interoperability implementation through you know, using these FHIR APIs. 
So the HEART model builds on existing state-of-the-art security and adds additional components to ensure that patient clinical data is securely exchanged. In addition to giving patients control over how their own data is shared, HEART defines the interoperable process for systems to exchange patient-authorized healthcare data consistent with open standards. So there are seven key benefits to HEART. First, HEART enables patient-directed sharing across a wide ecosystem. Um, so this is critical. Oftentimes we can share within a, a healthcare system or even um, you know, a healthcare system has multiple connected EMRs. But we need to also be able to share dynamically across uh, separate healthcare systems and across boundaries. In this particular example, we show a patient uh, that's in a transitions of care situation. She may be traveling from a hospital to a skilled nursing facility, then on to a long-term care facility or back to home health. And so often we are not able to you know, share that complete medical record as they move from facility to facility. And this is just one of many use cases that falls into this category. Nancy, I'm sorry to interrupt, but can you go into presenter mode so people can see um, the full slide? Oh, I'm so sorry, I thought I was there. So um, I think I'm just sharing the wrong, okay. Um, That's perfect. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so the second benefit, the patient controls who has access to the data. Um, so this gives patients control over how the data is shared. Electronic consents define the patient sharing the wishes. Authorization is based on patient-specified policy and enables multi-party sharing. Authorization is provided asynchronously and the patient makes a decision on who has access to the data. HART also works in conjunction with best practice security standards. So we want to know that our patient Alice really is Alice when we're sharing data. But we also want to know that the user requesting information is who they say they are. So often when I include a section on, you know, often when I do these presentations, I include a section on identity and authentication, but in the interest of time, I won't be doing that today, only to say that these are highly complementary and one supports the other. HIRE provides more granularity management over protected resources. So it controls who, what, and how at a fine grain, which resource, what scopes, what sensitive data. It also leverages existing open standards. Hard patient and provider clients are easy to use. So, so while um, not only the workflows in UX are intended to be easy, but care was also given in the standards design to make it easier for the protocol workflows. And then HART supports data segmentation for privacy. So HART originally included these profiles for confidentiality and sensitivity data. This is back in like 2016, 2017 kind of timeframe. This work was done in conjunction with SAMHSA, the consent to share project and data taking projects with the intent to support data segmentation for privacy. HART allows data to be exchanged dynamically while honoring patient privacy. So HART is a unique standard that delivers an elegant solution to these challenges. There's also a recorded webinar that further delves into the details of each of these bullets if you're interested in, in more of a deep dive. And these are some of the HART implementations. So we had health to go from EMR Direct, the HIE of one. Healthy Me PHR was one of the early implementations we did and that has since been replaced by Patient Share from our company, Patient Centric Solutions. Um, also, while the HART workgroup currently meets only infrequently, the UMA workgroup continues to be active under the Conterra initiative. This is really a great group of talented worldwide experts who, to continu who continue to further this important work. And uh, please feel free to reach out and join this group. Uh, additionally, we tend to do a lot of deep dives into applicable topics. So we've done a lot of work on business, legal, technical, as it, you know, and it's very tightly integrated into the standards work. Um, so that's actually pretty applicable to a lot of work that's currently being done with data segmentation. And also delegation. So not all patients really can manage their own sharing of their own policy or care to. So in some cases, they might delegate perhaps to a spouse or to an adult child, or they could even delegate to a care coordinator. So it ends up making this very applicable to more uh, use cases. So now let's talk a little bit about Heart, how Heart applies to data privacy and has direct applicability to, um, to uh, social determinants of health. So UM and HART support granulous uh, sharing at, the, at its core. 
And that level of granularity can be defined, and as you'll see in a minute, we've tried to, we have actually defined that granularity in different ways. But security profiles support this privacy granularity. So hard to find a standard for secure dynamic interoperability by connecting patient consent to the FHIR API. These are some of the security scopes. I know Kathleen talked about this a little bit earlier, and so I'm going to skip it, but this is just an example of some of them. Um, and then I'd like to talk a little bit more about existing technologies in support of privacy interoperability. So, you know, one of the components are electronic consents. So as most of you know, we have consent to share from SAMHSA. We also have our electronic consent on a patient share. And Adentos has also done some interesting work with a digital wallet. Um, and there are others as well. And then we have the value sets, which again, Kathleen mentioned, and these are mapped to sensitivity levels. Basically, it's a way of mapping uh, clinical codes to various levels of sensitivity. We have fire tagging and redaction engines, as was previously mentioned, and then HART and UMA to manage secure exchange. And by the way, UMA is, is really um, another way of, you know, not kind of an extension of HART. It's, you know, it's the same topics, just kind of moved over to a different work group. And then the underpinnings of all of this are the FHIR APIs, and of course, very important are trusted identity servers and related standards. And let's just mention some of the blocks and also the progress along some of those blocks as well. So um, the maintenance of value sets is currently one of the issues that we're addressing. So those value sets were initially defined by um, SAMHSA some years ago, and they were maintained for a while by SAMHSA, but they are no longer currently being maintained. So the Protecting Privacy to Promote Inter Interoperability work group um, has identified this as an issue and uh, are actively looking for another organization to take on the maintenance of these value sets. Another issue is data segmentation and coding. So most data coming from the FHIR APIs are not encoded, which is problematic. Um, however, and, and so, you know, hopefully as our standards evolve, folks will actually encode data. And there are also a number of artificial intelligence proposals to actually encode the data. But as applicable to this project, I'd like to point out that um, for a lot of recent projects, IG data is encoded. So for instance, the PASIO, post-acute care, Interoperability Workgroup has specified a number of assessments that are subject to uh, sensitive data. And in fact, all of those IGs very clearly encode their data. So if you want to exchange that data, it could be done using this, these data segmentation methods. And the similar is true for um, ELTSS, the Electronic Long-Term Services and Support Care Plan. And also for SDOH, uh, the gravity work in their IGs are defining the code sets. So again, if those code sets are already defined, you could actually create value sets for that those subset of codes and have this implemented to cover those particular IGs. Um, again, the blocks are always going to be around policies because it's challenging to get all the policies to match um, all the things that we're trying to do. And we're currently working on resolutions to those as well. And the work group um, PP2PI, which is protecting privacy to promote interoperability, is still in the early stages, but already they've done a lot of really great work. And if you're interested in this area, I'd recommend joining that group and, and kind of jumping on board. Um, so when I think of, when, when most people think of policies, um, a large number of policies are public policy. So in healthcare, we certainly have significant federal policies, state policies, and local policies. On top of that, we tend to have organizational policies. So a given healthcare system may have their own policies that work together with the public policies. But patient policies are a little bit different, and those are what support this patient-mediated exchange. So the premise is the patient has a right to their own data, and the patient has a right to share their data as they wish. So the patient defines who has access to the data, what parts of the data they have access to, for how long, and it can be revoked. And then on top of that, you can add features of delegation. So um, th this is just a little bit of different twist. It's a different paradigm, but it also alleviates some of the burden from organizations for managing um, that exchange of data when you can put the patient in control. Uh, this is just an example of the patient share consent. Um, and you know, in this particular case, um, our patient has created a number of different consents. And, she, and this is an example where she's chosen to share all of her information, i.e. not using the granular data option. Or she could also specify any subset of the data that we've 
that the application is giving her the ability to share. Um, so she can share at a granular level, she can define that consent duration, and she can revoke it at any point in time. Uh, she also has the ability to, um, she has a transparency ability, um, which I can go on at a little bit different time, kind of part of the paradigm. So if you look at these two sharing paradigms, um, on the left, you can see what we've implemented, which is, is more, um, you know, it shares data at the fire resource level and at categories of clinical data, much as much similar to the way that um, Josh had earlier explained in his project. But that same technology can be applied to support sharing sensitive data on a granular level as depicted here on consent to share. So the same technology can be used for either kind of paradigm. Um, it's just a matter of what the granularity paradigm is defined as. So getting a little bit of an idea of the user experience and kind of opportunities for sharing um, under UMA and HART. So the user could share at, she could opt in at runtime, but more typically she tend, the user would tend to share ahead of time. They also could share after the fact, they could get a request for access and then approve it after the fact, um, subsequently giving the, the user the ability to access. They can monitor at any time as part of our transparency features and they can withdraw at any time as well. And so in summary, the benefits for individuals, or in this case, patients, um, they can share access, not just with other apps, but with other entities and parties. They can choose to share not just when asked, but when they're really ready to truly decide they want to share. They can also get a unified view of what's been done, and often the best sharing choices are made only in retrospect. And then again, it has the three dimensions of choice. So in summing up, I'd like to point you to the various resources. There's a lot more detail than can be provided in a short um, webinar like this. Um, and so these are all listed here. And also on our homepage, uh, on our patient-centric solutions page under resources, I always list um, the more relevant recent um, resources. And there's some very good ones that are currently up just recently. We do tend to keep these current. So thank you very much. Thanks, Nancy. We'll pass it along to Bob now. Okay, thank you very much. I assume you can hear me, correct? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good. <clears throat> uh, I'm Bob Dieterle. I'm the technical director for the Gravity Project, among other things. Um, we're gonna go through a little bit of what we're doing in Gravity and the approach that we have taken for this st one to manage consent and the scope within which that consent is relevant. Next slide, please. The Gravity Project was started in May of 2019. Uh, it was a spinoff from work that was being done at Siren at UCSF. Um, the scope of the Gravity Project is to develop data standards to represent patient social determinants of health information uh, documented across uh, four clinical activities, screening, assessment, diagnosis, goal setting, and treatments or interventions. Next slide, please. In August of 2019, Gravity became a fire accelerator, taking advantage of the services offered by uh, HL7 to support fire accelerators. Next slide, please. Why are we focused on social determinants of health? Normal health care support only accounts for about 20% of uh, individual problems uh, related to health. Uh, of the remainder, uh, social determinants of health really focus on about 40% uh, physical environment, uh, although you could roll that up into social determinants of health, also focus on about 10%, and then health behaviors focus on about 30%. Next slide, please. And by the way, these are all barriers to uh, good therapy, whether it's uh, uh, the ability to get to an appointment for diagnosis, the uh, ability to get good food to support someone who has diabetes, uh, they all have an impact on care. Uh, we are uh, blessed with a number of uh, well-established um, uh, founders and uh, grants and in-kind support. We have them listed here. Next slide, please. <clears throat> we have roughly 1,800 participants uh, from virtually every uh, uh, stakeholder group, uh, clinical provider groups, community-based organizations, standard development organizations, federal and state government, payers, technology vendors, et cetera. Uh, 
we have a terminology public call uh, every uh, uh, Thursday and a technology call every Wednesday, and they're listed here. Next slide, please. We have two main work streams, one focused on terminologies, developing uh, the gaps and filling the gaps in uh, uh, terminologies related to specific uh, social in terms of health domains, whether it's uh, food insecurity or housing or transportation. Uh, that is the focus of that one stream is to develop a um, standards that have been uh, evidence-based so that we can go and have uniformity in the way we represent social determinants health information. The other is a technology stream, which I lead, <clears throat> and it is focused on developing a fire-based implementation guide to be able to exchange social determinants of health information. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the program management office. We're the ones that go and manage the day-to-day -day operation uh, and uh, set the uh, um, um, individual uh, uh, work with the strategic advisory group, our uh, executive uh, uh, committee, and our uh, technical advisory committee. Uh, Evelyn Diego is uh, the program manager. Uh, Carrie Louis Lewisberg is the project manager. Mark Savage is the uh, uh, policy lead. Uh, and uh, Sarah De Silva is the lead of the terminology work stream, and I'm the lead of the technology work stream. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, we created over the last year or so a uh, standard uh, specification for exchanging social determinants of health information. Um, it is a framework implementation guide supporting all the various domains of uh, social determinants of health uh, and is focused on the exchange of assessments, health concerns or problems, goals, referrals, consent, and we'll talk about that in particular, and aggregation for exchange of reporting. We validated this as an SQ1 in the January cycle. Next slide, please. Um, the various activities that were part of the implementation guide tie back into the terminology work that's being done. Assessments and surveys are link coded. Uh, health concerns or problems are ICD-10, uh, CM, CM or summit CT coded. Uh, goals are both link, it's an older slide, and SNOMED uh, CT. Um, interventions and procedures which document what's been done are SNOMED CT, CPT, and HICFIX. And then we work with uh, uh, NCQA and NQF uh, to uh, um, determine how to measure quality uh, in relationship to uh, social determinants of health. Uh, as you can see on the slide here, uh, we define consent, we'll talk about that in a second, and aggregation for reporting. Next slide, please. Uh, we have uh, defined a process for automating uh, survey instruments or assessment instruments uh, using link-coded uh, surveys uh, and be able to use open source uh, tooling to create fire questionnaires, deliver those questionnaires, and ultimately to produce a set of fire-based resources. Uh, uh, questionnaire response, observations recording the particular question and answer or answers, and then condition or health concerns, uh, which go and uh, indicate particular problems that an individual may have uh, based on the survey. Next slide, please. The implementation guide specifies a broad set of exchanges between all the various players. Uh, so exchanges uh, between providers, uh, and uh, uh, payers and government entities, uh, coordination platforms, uh, community-based organizations, uh, and individuals or their caregivers. So we touch base on a broad set of exchanges. Next slide, please. Uh, this shows them far more detailed. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, all of the blue arrows are the ones that we're supporting. Uh, including exchanges between providers, between payers, between payers and providers, and the other organizations that we mentioned. Uh, we have the ability within the guide to exchange any of the things that we talked about, uh, assessments, uh, closed loop referrals, uh, the ability to exchange goals, et cetera. Next slide, please. Um, give me one second here, do we? Uh, okay, 
so as we think in terms of sensitive data and consent around social determinants of health, uh, we have certain things that are always considered sensitive, some that are frequently considered sensitive, and some that are highly situational. So assuming everything that is social determinants of health data is sensitive probably is a step too far. We have to be very careful as to what we label and tag as sensitive data and how we protect it. Uh, certainly things related to spousal abuse or immigration status are normally considered sensitive. Uh, things that are frequently considered are sensitive are things like homelessness or uh, employment status. And the less obviously things like home address or telephone numbers for people that don't want to be contacted by community-based organizations directly, but rather prefer to contact the organization themselves. Uh, we have a series of things that uh, we need to support and consent. Uh, the ability to not share sensitive data with anyone. Uh, the ability to share sensitive data with specific organizations or individuals, uh, including protections on re-release of the information. You've heard about uh, this from uh, uh, Kathleen and then the ability to go and uh, take data for uh, uh, re-release. Uh, the ability to share specific data with specific organizations for referrals or interventions and then specific organizations that you do not wish to share with. This is not just inherent in the data, it's inherent in the exchange. And then the ability obviously to revoke consent. Um, we have a very limited set of protections afforded to individuals within the HIPAA controlled environment. We're pretty clear on what we can do. Uh, once we get, uh, and we have certain federal re regulations that uh, shall we say constrain that even more, 42 CFR part two, which uh, Kathleen has talked about. Uh, and then once we get outside of HIPAA, outside of covered entities and business associates, we have a very broad set of um, regulations that may or may not protect individual data and the ability to share it. It may vary significantly based on from state to state. Next slide, please. Because of this broad variability and because of where we are in defining and adopting uh, various standards like uh, you know, data segmentation for privacy and data tagging and uh, uh, things like uh, uh, consent, uh, what we've chosen to do as part of this release of the uh, implementation guide is focus on one and only one specific action. And that is passing consent to a business associate with permission to re-release that information outside of a HIPAA controlled environment. That is the one thing that we have defined. That doesn't mean it's the only thing that's important. It's the one thing we've chosen to define as part of this standard for trial use one, to test in pilots, to test in production. Once we have more guidance from the work that's being done by uh, folks at ONC, folks at HL7, uh, and we have some standards that are being adopted into regulation, we'll upgrade the implementation guide to support those. Uh, we're also looking forward to the work that uh, Josh and others are doing on SMART 2.0 uh, so that we can have more granular consensus part of access to data. Right now, our primary focus is on pushing uh, data based on uh, referrals and interventions. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the consent profile that we have within the implementation guide. We do use it primarily to go and have a provider and a patient sit together and decide <clears throat> what information is going to be released and to whom. And if that is uh, uh, through a business associate, then this consent resource would wind up uh, following that release of information. Next slide, please. Uh, this is an example of a reference implementation that we've built to test out the implementation guide. As you can see in here, <clears throat> we have the ability to find consent resources and to attach them to each intervention independently. Now that could be one consent resource that gets created with the intent of attaching it to multiples, or it could be a single consent resource for each of the interventions, deciding who has the right uh, to re-release that information. Next slide, please. Um, so who's working on it? I think you've seen from all the prior presenters, 
uh, security work group is working on it. The community-based care and privacy work group is working on uh, both data tagging and consent. Patient care is working on it. And at the moment, there are really only two uh, implementation guides that are focused on consent profiles for sharing information. One is uh, the Social Determinants of Health Fire Implementation Guide, which we just covered, and the other is uh, the Bidirectional Service E-Referrals, or BSER, Fire Implementation Guide. Next slide, please. Uh, we're at the point where we have resolved most of our ballot comments. We had 227. Uh, 198 have uh, approved uh, resolutions. Uh, we're working through the last 29 as part of restating a number of uh, uh, or several um, patient stories relate, related to sharing data. Uh, the intent is to have everything complete and submitted for publication by the end of June. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, these are uh, links to uh, joining the project. Um, uh, we had the one from the Connectathon. Um, uh, this is an older slide. Uh, and uh, submitting uh, uh, data elements. Uh, for inclusion in the work that uh, Sarah DeSilvi is doing, and then contact information broadly uh, to communicate with us. Next slide, please. And I believe that is the end. So thank you very much for your time. Great. Thank you, Bob, very much. Um, so we've received a lot of really good questions during this webinar. I'm really sorry we don't have time for them, but we will do our best um, to facilitate getting answers to these questions and reaching back out to you guys individually or addressing them up front at our part two webinar. Um, so with that, I just want to thank everyone for joining today and especially the presenters for sharing such great information. And we hope to see you all at part two on June 2nd. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you.